So if there is one thing that I struggle with the most in my life, it is failure. Or dare I say, the fear of failure. I am what you like to call a perfectionist, a type A personality. I unfortunately find purpose and validation in my successes. My 4.0 GPA while getting my doctorate, my shiny CV, all of my awards, and I have become so accustomed to not failing that even the smallest failure leads to my demise. Now, I'm not saying all of this this morning to hashtag humblebrag. No, I am saying this to paint to you just how inadequate I am at accepting failure. For example, let me take you back. Back to 2008, ah, the good old days. 2008, the year when Blu-ray just beat HD DVD as the standard. And that's about it because there was a strike in Hollywood, so there were no good movies or TV shows that year. Oh, and I guess our first African-American president was elected. I probably should have said that one first. And where was I? Okay, so I just moved to Arizona a year prior and I was a junior in high school. And not only was I a junior in high school, I was also in all AP classes, president of the National Honor Society, officer in math club, and marching band, tennis, track, environmental science club, drama club, physics club, five other clubs I can't remember the name to, and I was assistant manager in my part-time job. I was up at 5.30 a.m. every day and went to bed around 1 a.m. and I spent my lunch breaks studying in the library. I graduated high school with a 4.56 GPA and I was upset with that because you see taking unweighted classes like orchestra, even though I was getting a 4.0, getting an A in that class actually dropped my class ranking. Guys, I was your quintessential perfectionist. I was that girl with a 20 pound backpack who definitely did not have a date to prom, but I thrived off of it. See, if I was in everything and if I was doing well in everything, then I was important. I placed all, and I mean all of my value into my successes, into school, into my intelligence and my class ranking because it made me feel important, special, and accomplished. And in 2008, I was taking AP Chemistry, which ironically is the class that had me change my dreams for being a music teacher into going into the sciences. And I had an A all semester, just like the rest of my classes, until the final which despite studying for as hard as I could, I completely failed. I'm sorry, that means I got a C, C is failing to me. Which made my final grade in the class an 89, which is a B. And for a perfectionist, an 89 is like a thousand times worse than like an 85 because it means you were that close to the A. And to say that this broke me would be an understatement. My parents weren't home when I saw my grade and I lost it. It started with a blood curdling scream. Then I had a panic attack. I was hyperventilating. I threw up from crying so hard and I couldn't stop. After over an hour of this, my parents finally come home from dinner to see me curled up in a ball with a brown paper bag to my mouth, trying to control my breathing. And of course, my parents, they're freaking out like, what happened, what happened? And I barely managed to mutter out, I gotta be. Guys, this is laughable. I'm 16. Also, AP Chemistry was a weighted class, so it still counted as a 4.0 in my GPA. But I'm literally incapacitated for getting a B in a class. I had placed so much value and worth into my successes that I hadn't prepared myself to handle my failures. And I wish I could say that that was the last time I let getting a B affect me that way. I got three Bs in the course of my undergraduate career, and each one broke me in a new way I didn't think possible. When I got a B in genomics and biochemistry in the same semester, I didn't talk or eat for two days straight. I have a serious problem with failing, and even worse, failing for me is when I'm not perfect, which, as we all know, is actually impossible. And it's something I have been trying to work on and work through, but I think we can all be honest and say failing for anyone is really, really hard, especially in place value in ourselves rather than in God. Today, I wanna to talk about failure, about what it means for us. I'm not gonna try and fill it with those super cheesy and cliche quotes that people always like to throw at you when you're having a hard day, like winners aren't afraid of losing, but they literally never make you feel better. Failure freaking sucks. 
And literally no one aspires to fail, but it's going to happen to all of us. And it's how we handle our failures, how we invite God into our failures that really makes a difference. So let's get into it. So as you know, we have been talking about the Bible hunk, Samson, the ridiculously strong man with some pretty spectacular hair. And he was pretty awesome and famous. I mean, this dude killed like a thousand people with the jawbone of a donkey. And if that's not impressive, I don't know what is. But as we know, Samson doesn't stay this hot shot for long. Delilah, not the one from the Plain White Tees song, cuts his hair, he gets betrayed, loses his strength, and basically just keeps failing. In Judges 16, verse 23, it states, Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to celebrate, saying, Our god has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. So there's like a thousand people gathered in the Colosseum, and they're all praising the God Dagon, this pretty funky looking fish god dude. And their main enemy, Samson, has been caught. Now that's pretty exciting if you're a Philistine. This is like enemy number one, this great warrior who's killed thousands of your people and he's been captured. And now you're about to see him absolutely humiliated. The Bible continues. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison and he performed for them. So, so far the Philistines, their fish god Dagon has delivered. I mean, here is Samson the Great, now weak and eyeless and ashamed for all to see. Imagine being Samson right now. This is by far the lowest that you can get. You're put on display for all of God's enemies to see, and you're mocked at and forced to entertain them. He is shamed. He has failed. Now, there's an important point that I want to make that I think a lot of people don't take the time to really sit down and think about. People are really, really good at focusing on their failures. And whether it's an addiction, being unfaithful to someone you love, saying you're never going to do something again and doing it three days later. We focus on these failures and we let it destroy ourselves. But a failure is an event, never a person. And I myself need to get that tattooed somewhere on my body. A failure is an event never a person. Think of some really successful people. They have all failed at some time, but they are not failures. One of my favorite athletes is Michael Jordan. And yes, it's mostly because I'm in love with the movie Space Jam, and I literally know nothing else except that he played for the Chicago Bulls. But come on, Space Jam. And I know I promise no cliche quotes, but Michael Jordan is famous for saying this quote. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. Michael Jordan, one of the most celebrated athletes of all time, has failed throughout his career, but he is not a failure. If we let our failures define us rather than embrace them and learn from them and understand that they are just events, then how can we ever progress forward? We see Samson fail over and over and over again to the point where a lot of people would probably think that they're a failure, that there is no way that they can accomplish anything, no way God can use them for something great. But trust me, and as we're going to see later in the story, God can and will do just that. Now, there are a few natural responses to failure. One, which I think is the most common, is remorse. And unfortunately, this is where a lot of people stop. I feel bad about what I did. I shouldn't have done it. I'm a bad person. And that's where it ends. Or some people, like me, internalize the remorse and turn it into their identity. I'm the worst person, I'm no good, I have no future, I hate myself, I hate my life, what am I doing? But once again, it stops there. 
Other people like to turn it outward and will play the victim rather than owning up to their own failure, which I also do all the time. This wouldn't have happened if you did this. It's their fault. I had no choice. If it wasn't for Delilah, I would be fine. But the response to failure still all stops there. Remorse and guilt are natural responses to failure, but there is a much better and more productive response, and that is repentance. The I own it, it was my fault, I blew it. I turned away from what is right, from what God intended, and I'm going to turn back to what is right. Remorse focuses on the bad. It looks back and focuses on all the things that we did wrong. Repent means turning from the lower to what is higher. Literally, from the word repent, re means turn and pent means highest. We turn from our lower sinful ways and turn back to God's higher ways. We aren't just saying, I feel really bad about what I did. We're owning up. We're saying, I am turning completely to God to let him redeem me to his divine purposes. Feeling guilty or remorseful about doing something isn't bad if it moves us to repentance. It's when we let our failures define who we are, when we place our identities in it. That is pure evil and it is destructive. When we fail, we need to not turn to evil and let the failure become our identity. We need to see it as just what it is, an event. And we need to seek repentance and seek God and let him use us for his divine purpose. Now we have all done and are going to do things in our lives that we can't take back, that we can't undo. With the exception of Gmail's really great new feature where you can like retract an email once you accidentally send it. But right, you can't send back that super awkward text you sent about how horrible a member of your group project was being, only to realize you sent it to the group text with your group project and not just your friend. You can't take back something you've said. You can't take back the way you made someone feel. You can't take back cheating or lying. Once it's done, it's done. You can't undo the past and the mistakes that you've made, but you can repent. And eventually, Samson realizes this, that he wasn't created to be mocked at and laughed at. He was created by God to do something important, to be significant. The Bible continues in verse 25. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women all the rulers of the Philistines were there, and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson has a revelation. He doesn't let his failures define him as a person. Yes, he is broken, but he prays to God to strengthen him one more time. And notice it's only one more time. He's saying, God, I know I've messed this up. I have blown it and I don't need a bunch more chances. I just need one. Because at this point, Samson is broken, but broken of himself. And now it's all about God. Samson knows he can't do anything on his own at this point and that he never really could. Even though he still wants revenge on this Philistines and his motives may be a bit mixed, he is relying on God for the strength to fulfill his role as Israel's deliverer. In this moment, it's no longer about Samson, about his strength, what he has done, how many of the enemies he has killed. It had always been about Samson, about his failures and his successes, but at this point, anything he does now is about God. He is saying, God, it's always been about me, but at this moment and from this moment on, Everything I have, I will give to you. I am no longer the main character of this narrative. You are everything I have, and I will use it all to honor you this one last time. And this is something that is so important for us to remember, that we were created to honor and glorify God with our life. 
We shouldn't live our lives stuck in the past, looking over our failures and thinking of what we should have done, hating ourselves, beating ourselves up, or blaming others for things that could have been. We need to stop letting what we have done or haven't done stop us from doing what God wants us to do. We need to turn away from sin and turn towards God. We can't change our past, but we can change our future. Samson does this. He turns away from his failures, from his shame, and reaches to God. He calls for God to provide him strength one last time. And in the Bible it says, Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let them die with the, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus, he killed many more when he died than when he had lived. Samson was down. He was defeated he had failed. But here's the thing, with God, even when a man is down, he is not out. Because even in our failures, God can accomplish his purpose. Samson's purpose was to deliver God's people from the Philistines. And in his lowest moment, at the darkest, most broken moment of his life, he reaches out to God. And guess what he does? In his last dying breath, Samson kills more Philistines than he had in his entire life. God can use us in our failures. Even when it seems like it's over, it's not. Unless we are dead, we are not done. There is so much more in you. We need to quit living in the remorse of the past. Well, I shouldn't have. I'm not good enough. They'll never trust me. I can't recover from this. These are lies. If you're a Christian, you have the same spirit that Christ raised from the dead inside of you. You may be down, but you are not out. God can do anything. He can bring you out of the darkness. He can lift you up. You are not a failure. You are greatness. You are a purpose waiting to happen. So I ask all of you today, what are the pillars that you are tied to? What are the pillars that you need to push down? Is it pride? You don't want to admit that you've done something wrong, that you need help, that you can't handle it on your own. Is it anger, being mad at the world or mad at yourself? Is it lying? Is it hatred? Is it hatred at yourself? You didn't lose the weight. You didn't get the job. You aren't happy with where you are. You feel stuck and you don't know how to get out. Push those pillars down. But you have to push. And you may not be able to do it without God's help, but you have to push. You can't say you want things to be different and not do anything. If you want a different result, you have to do something different. Admit that you need help. Go to counseling. Talk to someone. Admit that you were wrong. It's not just pretending you're going to do something about it. Do it. Pray. Turn away from the dark and turn to the highest. Repent and let him work through you and push. And my goodness, it is not going to be easy. Samson only had to give his life one time. And he gave his life completely to God and then died immediately. Honestly, that isn't that hard. Because surrendering to God means giving your life daily. Look at what God did in Samson when he surrendered his life to God. And imagine what he can do with you if you surrender wholly unto him. When we fail, stop and listen. We can go the easy way. We can be filled with remorse, with the idea of, I shouldn't have, it wasn't my fault. We can define ourselves as failures and give up. Or we can repent, turn to God, say, God, it isn't about me. I give you my whole life. You gave me something and I didn't do what you wanted me to do with it. I own that and I am sorry. It's no longer about me for the rest of my life. It's about you. Help me accomplish what you need me to do. Please pray with me. God, 
Thank you so much for giving us all a purpose to serve you. Please let us see our failures, not as who we are, but just as an event. When we fail, let us not just have remorse or guilt, but to repent, to turn from our sin and turn towards you. Give us the strength to push down our pillars, to admit that we need help when we need it, to admit that we were wrong. God, let us give you our whole lives to surrender to you daily so that we can use what you have given us to accomplish what you need for us to do. Amen.